everyone. Um, first, obviously to start, we really want to say thank you from the Undiagnosed Diseases Network Foundation to Global Genes for this opportunity to have a session specifically for undiagnosed related topics. And so thank you so much Global Genes for having us. Um, before we got started, we all thought it would be helpful to us. Now, now I can't really see out there, so it may not be that helpful, but if you're comfortable, would you raise your hand if you are undiagnosed or if you are a caregiver to someone who's undiagnosed? Okay, that's helpful, thank you. And have you all heard of the Undiagnosed Disease Network or the UDN? Okay, good, so some have, some haven't. Okay, that's helpful for yeah. us as we get started. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and introduce ourselves by way of sharing our stories. I'm gonna push this button here. And you can read our stories along as we're also introducing ourselves, but we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna talk about our stories, um, managing life without a diagnosis. Some of you may know the Every Life Foundation recently came out with their report and on average it can take up to seven years to receive a diagnosis. And so on average means that some are actually longer than that. And many of you probably are familiar with that or have experienced lived experience with that. And so that's why we really felt like this topic was important. And we're gonna share our stories and we're gonna share a little bit of our experiences and we absolutely will have time for questions later. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with intros. Let's just start on the end. Stephanie, do you wanna? Hi, hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Tomlinson. My son, Ted, um, was is part of the UDN program. We have sort of a unique experience joining the UDN. We were at the NIH to be enrolled in a completely different study. Had never heard of the UDN because we are one of the first families to be asked to join. Um, I cannot say enough about the process. We started in 2014 and just last summer of 2022, we got a partial diagnosis. So, and he has gone from being, um, we had a working diagnosis, I know everybody loves that term, of a neuromuscular disorder and had been in a power chair since he was six. And he has not been in a chair since for the last five years due to the work and what we've learned at the NIH regarding just neuromuscular diseases and how his body was responding or not responding to varying um, treatments. So that's, that's, that's how I got here. Okay, Sarah is next. Hi, my name is Sarah Marshall. Um, my youngest daughter, Phoebe, who is now 15, um, she began having symptoms at age two, um, or significant symptoms at age two, and um, really over the years we've seen over 17 um, specialists um, that address all different organ systems, and we came to the UDN. I heard about it through another parent um, who said, you should check out the UDN, and um, in 2016, and we applied in 2017. And in 2021, um, there was a paper that came out um, where she was one of the subjects in the paper that identified her gene, which is GDF11, um, a loss of function um, gene, or a loss of function in that gene um, that they think is a partial diagnosis for her. Um, and they did that through the research arm of the genome sequencing and exome sequencing. They used zebrafish, the, or the model organisms group looked at zebrafish and um, fruit flies to prove that this GDF11 was an important um, gene to the, to the function of um, humans, and it is. So um, because of that diagnosis, um, she has been able to get treatment for some specific symptoms that she's experienced and really been able to improve her quality of life, so. Great, well I'll finish with the introductions and you'll notice that we are all rare disease moms or undiagnosed moms, so that's what we have in <laughs> common here. My son Mitchell's my oldest son and he was a typically developing child until the age of 12 when he started having ataxia, walking funny. Um, friends told me, oh gosh, he's just growing. You know, he's, he's just clumsy. My brother was clumsy too when he was that age and I actually am a pediatric nurse by background and so, you know, my spidey sense was like, eh, I think it's a little more. 
And so through lots of different doctors, we live in St. Louis and you know, he is seen by Washington University in St. Louis, which is you know amazing medical institution. And I always thought, oh gosh, they're gonna have the answers to everything. But no, you know, we don't know, I don't know, became just a common refrain that we kept hearing everywhere that we went. And I was really shocked that in this day and age, we don't know is an answer. And so I learned quickly that yes, indeed it is. So he was 12 at the time, had a, a periods of, you know, what we thought at the time was relapsing, remitting, um, you know, would be in a wheelchair and then would work really hard, get back up to walking with a cane, and then back would have a flare or relapse. And so he joined the Undiagnosed Diseases Network in 2017, um, went to the Baylor site. And he had had exome sequencing back when he was 12 or 13, and there was a variant of unknown significance, so VUS, that they just said, well, you know, it's this ACOX1 gene. That's not it, because there's a disease that we know, it's an ACOX1 um, deficiency, and he doesn't have that, because ACOX1 deficiency, the babies usually die within a year, you know, he's 12, that's not it, so we're gonna not look at that. Well, five years later, in the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, there was a expert in paroxysomal disorders at the table who said, now, I actually think we need to look at that. We need to look at what happens if you only have one copy of it. So through, again, model organisms, fruit flies, I learned all about fruit flies and how they're so similar to humans. They did a model of Mitchell's DNA and his mutation and the fruit flies couldn't fly. I remember getting that phone call and, I, and my husband was like, oh my gosh, Mitchell can't fly either. They <laughs> solved it. <laughs> um, but the fact that the fruit flies obviously had um, mobility issues, you know, really keyed them into it. And then ultimately they found a second patient through Gene Matcher and that was of course the aha moment. So ultimately my son was diagnosed with ACOX1 gain of function, which is new, a new diagnosis. There was a publication in 2020 of the first three patients um, my son did pass away in 2019, and they ultimately um, gave the disease the name Mitchell Syndrome after my son. My husband and I then went on to form a small foundation, originally with the hopes of just supporting patients and families, and then ultimately realized we had to take the next step. And so we're now working to fund research into treatments and possible cures and working on a natural history study. And I'm actually super excited. I won't call them out. If they want to raise their hand, they can. But one of our Mitchell Syndrome families is here right now. There's, there they are. So I'm very excited that they came to join us. And that is our story. So thank you for hear, listening to all of our stories here. So. So the first question we're gonna ask, and this kind of, you know, might be a little lighthearted moment. I, I'm, I'm assuming many of you that are undiagnosed in this room will have some similar feelings to us up here. People sometimes think they're helping with comments that they make to you, right? Um, so, <laughs> so I'd like to ask, and I'll start with Sarah, you know, what are some comments made during your diagnostic odyssey for Phoebe that were maybe not so helpful? Well, <clears throat> I. I think some of the most frequent, frequent comments, you know, she would have various, like I said, various symptoms, and people would ask me, well, have you brought her to a chiropractor? I have this really great chiropractor that I know. Or have you tried a naturopath? I have this really great naturopath or acupuncture, all these kind of complementary um, and alternative medicines, um, you know, very well-meaning people um, suggesting that never um, felt very helpful at all. Right. Meaning well, but not so helpful. Missing the mark. Right, missing the mark, yep. yeah. Sarah and I both, by pure chance, live in Minnesota, and one of our favorite questions is, have you been to the mail? <laughs> 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 oh, everybody knows. <laughs> so yeah, have you been to the mail? And you just go, the mail doesn't want us. And they just look at you like, I thought they took everyone, and you're like, no, mm -hmm. no, they don't. Um, the other one that I used to just struggle with, and to this day still do, is, well, God only gives you what you can handle. And I always say, well, I guess we know what God thinks of you then, because <laughs> cause I just have to. <laughs> so it's just those kind of comments or people, I know they're well-intended, but um, I have learned that sometimes you just need to be, take, hold space with somebody. You don't need to have a comment. You can just be there with them. And sometimes the silence is so much better than have you tried a different vitamin pack. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's great advice. Well, we're not, I'm not good with silence. <laughs> Very quickly, I start feeling awkward. Um, I mean, I had similar comments. My husband is actually a minister, so as you can imagine, we got some God-related comments. Um, but then me being a pediatric nurse, you know, I get the comments of, oh, you were the perfect mother for him. God knew it. And I'm like, <sighs> okay, thanks. I can um, never do what you do, Sarah. <laughs> right. Yes, right. you could. Yeah. Um, the, and then the other one for me that was just always so unhopeful was, oh my gosh, you know, I know you guys are struggling. My sister's cousin's boyfriend's daughter has eczema and oh my gosh, it's so rough for them. And, and like, yes, don't get me wrong. I know a lot of friends who have children with eczema and it is rough, but just to think that because they know somebody who knows somebody, they kind of know what we're going through is not helpful. So. But I, I have to say, we all understand that nobody wins in the Olympics of suffering. Right. I mean, comparative suffering is just an absolute bankrupt idea. And we know that everybody has a different threshold point. We might be a little more calloused because we have really hit the wall a few times. But um, those are just some of the odd things that people say to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. I'm sure many of you can relate. So our next question, we want to talk about coping strategies. So, you know, what along your journey has helped you um, in general, or what coping strategies have helped you to not feel alone? Um, let's start with Stephanie on this one. Well, I like to call it my corner friends. Um, everybody in here, we all have our circle of friends, our people that we know we can count on. And that's great, those are the people you need to have. But what you really need are your corner friends. And those are the women or the people in your corner who really get you. They understand when you've had enough and when you're not ready to back down yourself, they're the type of people to pull you out of the fight. My girlfriends will say, we're buying pizza, she's getting vodka, you're coming over, we're done. And you're gonna take a breather for the weekend and think about something other than Ted. And that has been probably the most helpful for me is to find my corner friends. They are the people who hang on to the other end of my rope. When I'm ready to just let go, they pull me back in. Um, I cannot, I unfortunately had the, along the pathway with Ted, my uh, husband died suddenly in the midst of all of this. And so there I was alone, just really grappling with literally starting our journey at the NIH and dealing with that and two other kids at the same time. And I can honestly say that I have never experienced so much compassion from people I didn't even know who just held us up and allowed me and taught me how to take a break. I know we all hear that phrase, put your oxygen mask on first. Every caregiver has to put their mask on. And it took me a while to realize that my mask was maybe some Wellbutrin, you know, maybe a little anti-anxiety medicine to get through some things and that it's okay to have therapy and to really you know, say the quiet part out loud. Sometimes you have to say it out loud to sort of take away some of its power. Well, I'll go ahead and answer yeah. since yeah. you know, part of my answer is, talks about medication as well. Um, I remember the day my son was in the hospital, and you know, this is even more awkward because it was the hospital that I worked at as a nurse, and his neurologist was walking down the hall and I was like, hiding in a room because I did not want to hear what she was going to tell me. I was like having a panic attack because I saw her walking and I, I just, I didn't want to know. And it was probably my first time ever having a panic attack. And so I, my primary care doctor um, was also a friend. And for the first time ever, I decided that maybe Xanax was what I needed to be the best mom in the hospital. And you know, just that half of Xanax really helped me to calm down, be able to be there for him. But I mean, I still remember that feeling of, oh my gosh, I see her, she's coming. Is she coming to our room? You know, and she was probably like the neurologist on the floor seeing everybody. She might not even have been coming to our room, but I just had this sense of panic and she was gonna give us bad news. So definitely counseling meds, whatever, whatever you need to do to stay healthy yourself so you can be there for your loved one. Um, the other thing in general that I did to cope, and you know, kind of if you were here for the session before, being undiagnosed, a lot of times you do just start looking for common symptoms. 
So, okay, I don't have a diagnosis that matches you, but my lived experience every day might match you. So my son had hearing loss and had to get a cochlear implant, and that's part of the Mitchell syndrome pathology um, is hearing loss. And so we joined teens with cochlear implant groups. I mean, I, I was like that mom trying to find every resource I could. He um, had a um, central line catheter and he got infusions. And so I was like, oh, well, cancer patients get infusions too. So I I was calling up, or, like, my son doesn't have cancer, but he gets infusions and he's immune compromised sometimes. Can he join your support group? And so really just finding like anywhere that we could fit and, and people for the most part were welcoming. Um, so since I didn't have a named disease, I just really went out there to every symptom based group that I could find on Facebook, in person, anywhere. And, and that was helpful for us. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think for, for me, there's two things. I mean, I, I hear people, whether they have a rare disease or not, just in everyday life coping and, you know, what are you doing um, to take care of yourself? And I hear a lot of women in particular say, well, go get, go get um, a pedicure, go get a massage. And while those things are nice, those aren't, to me, those aren't the day-to-day -day things that, that need to be done to take care of myself. And for me, the day-to-day -day things is the routine of life. Um, Sometimes when you're undiagnosed, <laughs> the routine really can be dis disrupted um, at a moment's notice. But things like making my bed every day and exercising every day and just and having my same cup of coffee and the two different coffee cups that are my favorite coffee cups, um, those are the things that kind of um, just keep me feeling um, stable uh, from day to day. And the other thing um, for me, um, something, you know, some people do prayer, some people do meditation or yoga. Um, one thing that I personally have, that, that I've meditated on for many years now is the idea of a labyrinth. So for those of you who haven't given a lot of thought to labyrinths, labyrinths um, actually are not mazes. Um, there is one point of entry and there is always a center. So in the, in the diagnostic odyssey, you're entering that diagnostic odyssey at that point of entry, and there are answers at the center, um, or there's treatment at the center. And as you're walking this labyrinth, it can feel confusing and discombobulating and scary, um, but you actually don't need a map to get to the center. You just have to keep going. You just have to trust that you will eventually get to the center. And for me, that was a really helpful concept for me to, to think about, to meditate on. Um, and that's just one thing that I've clinged to over the years, so. I'm gonna throw you to a curveball. We didn't talk about this one, but it just kind of came to me um, because I know that all of us have other children besides our child who was undiagnosed and rare. Any coping mechanisms for them? Um, I, you know, from my own perspective, now many, many years later, my, my daughter, who is, you know, an amazing communicator and really is a feeler, you know, is, is, is letting me know through her counseling process that she felt a lot of neglect during this time frame. And, and I, at the time, didn't really think of that because she was five, six, seven, and, and whenever we were dealing with Mitchell stuff, she was with grandma. Well, like, what could be better than being with grandma, right? And, and, and I always, my husband and I were like, she's fine, she's with grandma. But now I'm, I'm seeing the trauma that she went through as a, as a younger sibling with us not maybe being emotionally available or with us physically, like being there the night before and then surprise, the next morning we're gone at the hospital. So any coping mechanisms that any of your other kids have used or maybe looking back, you wish you had done? <laughs> We, we had the default to grandma, definitely. I have two older daughters, um, and through the last five or six years, we've really sort of um, dissected a few things out. And we had always been told, even without a diagnosis, just with Ted's symptomology, they said, you know, expect his life expectancy to be around 10 or 12. Well, he's 23 now, so. But hearing that, my daughters really had a hard time attaching to their brother because they felt he was not going to be part of our family forever. So they never really developed that bond with him. And now my oldest daughter really struggles feeling um, that she sort of sabotaged any relationship she could have with him. Um, the middle daughter, who un unfortunately had to do a lot of therapies with us because she was at the age where 
where I went, she went, he went sort of thing. Um, and she wishes that there had been a little bit more of a screen between what she witnessed and what she experienced um, and her reality. I was very quick to always say, fair is not equal, you know, because they would be like, it's not fair. And I'd be like, fair is not equal. And um, all of the resources go to the kiddo who needs it at the time, right? That's just how it is as a family. And all, all of the resources went to Ted. And I look back now and, and see where my, my other two kids really sacrificed. And I wished, even though the grandparents were our default and they, again, it was like Disney World for them, literally sometimes, um, they still wanted mom and dad. That's the bottom line. They still felt like they weren't completely connected to the whole story. And I wished I would have maybe not relied on external support and kind of was able to be more for them. Yeah, and I, you know, <laughs> um, I think for us, um, you know, when Phoebe was young, um, I was, I'm no longer married, but I was married. And at the time, um, their dad and I really, um, I don't know, I guess took a team approach. And, and he really did <laughs> take care of the kids when I was at the hospital with Phoebe. And um, I think in a lot of ways, we, we tried to protect them from all that was going on with her. And if there was a soccer game, I would, you know, be like, okay, I'm gonna go run to the soccer game for an hour while she's inpatient or, you know, she's sick <laughs> at home. And, um, you know, I would act as if things were normal. I tried to keep things normal for them. And, you know, it's interesting, last week I did a presentation in DC, um, talked more in depth about um, Phoebe's diagnostic odyssey. And my 21 year old uh, looked at it and she's like, I didn't know Phoebe had that many diagnoses. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, they're listening today right now. So I'll have to go back and ask them like, you know, were we protective? Did we provide that normal, normalcy that I really, really wanted to, to provide for them? Um, that was my hope at the time, and um, I tried to be normal right. in the midst of all the abnormal. <laughs> it's interesting you say that because I, I used that phrase at the hospital one time when the social worker came in and asked a bunch of questions, and I said, well, we're just trying to have things normal for the girls, and she looked me dead in the eye and she said, none of this is normal. Why are you trying to make this normal? And that was the first time somebody had been very blunt with me on your child in the ICU is never normal. And the people over here need to understand this is not normal. And that was a really hard line for me to get over. Mm. Yeah. Well, this next question kind of goes along, you know, we're kind of hindsight, and I, I certainly did not mean to bring up any feelings of guilt or, you know, but we all got the, we have the feelings. I'm sure I didn't make them happen. Um, we can all look back and wish we did things differently. But looking back as far as the, di the diagnostic, undiagnosed journey, in a perfect world, what do you wish had been different? Um, I, I have pretty strong feelings about ours. Um, I wish that we had been introduced to palliative care sooner. Um, I have since learned that this is actually a common issue that you know many physicians have a difficult time just getting to that step. They want to keep you know trying to solve it. They want to keep you know and 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 they don't understand that they can keep doing that, but you can also get palliative care and be have the support that you need. Our palliative care team was amazing. You know, Mitchell was still getting treatments and still the UDN was doing the fruit flies, but palliative care was helping us with his goals, which was getting to college. So having a personal care assistant, you know, getting, you know, whatever resources we needed for him to go to college. And, and so having that palliative care team on board so much sooner would have really helped a lot. So that, that's my big one. And then the other one is just the concept of anticipatory grief. Now, I'm, I can't believe I didn't really know it or understand it, but at the time, no one ever explained to me, like, he doesn't have to be dead for you to have grief. Right? Like I thought, oh, grief is only when someone dies. No one ever explained to me, no, no social worker in the hospital, no, no doctor. Um, and now granted, I, you know, they probably thought I had it all together, <laughs> which I did not. Um, but 
that I could grieve that he wasn't like his friends. He wasn't doing the same thing as his friends. I could grieve, you know, loss of, you know, expectations. There were so many things that I was grieving, but I didn't even know it, and that he was grieving, and, you know, he had anticipated anticipatory grief. So those are my two big ones, um, but what about you guys? Anything you wish had been different in a perfect world? Well, besides just not having to deal with it yeah. at all. Well, the things that I wish that were different, it's nothing I could have actually changed. Um, I wish that my own uh, family, outside of my children, at the time my husband, had been more supportive. Um, it's really, it, for my family in particular, it seemed um, particularly difficult for them to understand um, that I don't know. Um, you know, we would come back from the doctor or the hospital and they'd say, well, what's wrong with her? It's like, well, they're not sure. And, you know, I think there's this general belief among the general population is like, well, you go to the doctor and they diagnose you, they tell you what's wrong and they figure out a treatment plan. And, you know, being a, in the diagnostic odyssey, you just realize relatively quickly that, you know, medicine really is a science and it's an art. And um, there aren't, you know, not everyone has strep throat and not everyone gets penicillin and, you know, gets better. And so um, when I, came you know, back to my family year after year with different things happening and saying you know, they don't know what's wrong with her. Um, I mean, they're like, what kind of doctors are you with? <laughs> you know, don't they know anything? Have you gone to the Mayo Clinic? <laughs> um, we love that one. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, and over time it's, um, I'm, in, in many ways I'm still close to my family, but that's one thing that I don't talk about with them at all. I don't talk about her diagnosis. In the last couple of years, she started a new um, treatment that's really helped one of her symptoms that really was debilitating for her. Um, she also gets monthly infusions. She's, she has myasthenia gravis as well. Um, and so she's on two ma major medications that really help her quality of life. Um, and uh, my family has said, wow, she's like, she's just blossoming, Sarah. She's doing so awesome, she's so great, and she is. If you saw her here, if she was sitting up here right now, you would never know that she has had over 20 surgeries in her life and uh, hospitalized multiple times. Um, you know, you just wouldn't, you wouldn't know it. And she is blossoming, but it's because she got a diagnosis and that diagnosis led to a treatment and she's getting treatment and that's why she has a pretty typical teenage life right now. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my family actually doesn't know that, they just think she's outgrown <laughs> whatever it is was going on with her for you know, the first 13 years of her life. So um, that's something I wish right. was yeah. different. Okay. I wish I had taken my thoughts of a child as being a research librarian seriously because I never knew I was going to need to be a research librarian <laughs> as a grown up. And um, when Ted was, he was born in 1999, he is a Y2K baby, and um, the internet was not as robust as it is now. And I can remember waiting to get on the internet after everybody went to sleep and doing the whole AOL annoying <laughs> dial up thing and using web crawler and just putting together symptom strings and just trying to find anything that I could to explain why my child was failing. Like why, what was happening? How could I fix this? And um, I, again, I was new to the internet. The internet was new to the world and it, th that and just truly understanding my position in the, what I call the team of TED. Uh, and I think a lot of you have heard this throughout the last day or so, is that we have a team of doctors. And I always look at myself as the coach of the team. Uh, and I will be the first one to say if you're on the bench or if you're actively gonna participate in TED's team. And I have had doctors come into the room and say, my goal today is not be fired by you. And I'm like, that's always a good goal because right now you're looking at bench time. <laughs> um, and honestly, because I know, like you know, you know your person better than anyone else. And I wish I had taken that, that level of um, knowledge, self-knowledge that I had a little more seriously and kind of asserted myself sooner into the process instead of being more of a passive bystander in the in the room okay thank you um, i'm going to put a slide up real quick um, we want to take a few minutes and tell you about 
the UDNF, or the Undiagnosed Diseases Network Foundation. Um, this um, organization was formed last year, and our mission is to improve access to diagnosis, research, and care for all individuals with undiagnosed and ultra-rare diseases. Um, I'm gonna give you a little preview on a coming soon program. It's our patient navigation program. I am currently in week three as the program director for this new program. Um, we are hoping to launch a pilot in early 2024. We are so grateful to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative who recently gave the UDNF a two and a half million dollar donation specifically to start this patient navigation program. Our intention is to support families and patients. I know, it's so <laughs> exciting. Our intention is to support patients and families from before they even apply to the Undiagnosed Diseases Network through the end of whatever their continuum may be, receiving a diagnosis, not receiving a diagnosis. Um, ultimately, hopefully 2025, our intention is also to offer this service to patients who are not being seen at the UDN. But for our pilot, we are starting with patients who are actually applying to the Undiagnosed Diseases Network um, and hopefully accepted and going on to being seen at one of the sites. So um, Stephanie in a little bit is gonna talk about how you can connect with us, um, but if you follow the UDNF, social media, our website, you'll be able to find out more about our patient navigation program. Um, the next steps are hiring a couple patient navigators, so um, you can always come and chat with me about that. We're hoping to post those jobs within the next few weeks. And then just continued program development and site selection, the, the UDN, has sites all over the United States and we're working um, on some site selection criteria to pick which sites we're gonna do our pilot at and just looking forward to launching the program and expanding the program as well. So it's exciting. Okay, so Sarah, you wanna talk about our resources? Yeah, so with that, um, so udnf.org, it does not yet have the um, patient resource uh, manual of sorts online, but it's something that we're working on. There's a volunteer group that's been really working on it for almost a year now, and um, really hoping to um, you know, provide resources to those that are un, undiagnosed. Um, and I think even, even if you are diagnosed, looking for resources, you know, um, uh, medical devices, you know, like trying to get stuff, that stuff paid for, um, helping people get on insurance. In my, in my non-mom life, in my professional life, I'm a medical case manager for women and children with um, chronic disease, and so I know a lot of the systems hurdles that families face when trying to access care, trying to access medication, and so those are the, some of the types of tools that we're trying to just make available um, to, to people that come to udnf.org. Um, you know, just to support people. So um, again, follow us on, on UDNF <laughs> or, you know, follow our page. I think, is it on, on Twitter? Oh, yeah, or on, on Facebook, sorry, on okay. Facebook. And I think, I, I don't wanna speak too soon, but I probably will anyway. I think eventually UDNF is hoping to have um, some type of a patient, um, patient group that can talk amongst themselves, but a lot of details of that need to be worked out. So I know it's something that we're, talking about um, and I really hope will be um, something that is actually you know able to be put into place so those are some of the things that you can look forward to so I'm gonna put some QR codes up while Stephanie explains how you can connect with us and you can take a few pictures of these slides it's really simple just go out to our website udnf.org um, from there you'll find our links to our social media accounts um, we plan to have those to be very interactive and robust um, right now, Sarah and I manage the UDN Peer. Is it UDN Peer? Mm -hmm. Facebook, where the families who are already in or part. Fam the families the, page. The families page yeah. for patients who are already involved in the UDN program. Um, and from there, we have learned a ton about this community and where our weaknesses are and supporting them. And I'm all about building community. I cannot say how important it is to find your tribe, find the people who speak your language, understand your heartache, and lean on them. And so it is my mission to make sure that we build this online community so we can keep bringing the world together because we're only, we're only stronger together. And if you are a UDN participant and haven't, don't know about the Facebook page, um, you can look it up. You have to 
um, it's it's a private page, so you'll have to kind of you know apply or however I don't know how they. I think you go through. But I'm actually one of the moderators, yeah. so if if Same. you're a UDN <laughs> participant, I will you know let right. you in our group. So yeah. <laughs> you have to put what site you were seen at, yeah. and yeah. so that's how it's they not hard. Keep it private. So. Yeah, great. It's not hard. Well, I'm going to put our contact information up now um, and leave that if we could leave that up just for a little bit. Um, I wanted to give everybody an opportunity to ask any questions. We're open to questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, I do have another question for our panel that we can touch on if there's no questions from the audience, but really you all are the people we're here for, so we'd love to hear any questions you have. So I'm not sure if you want to shout it out. Do we have a, a microphone monitor during our session? No. So just yell. Oh, there we go. There's, <laughs> hi. Yeah. Any questions from anyone in the audience on anything we've talked about? Okay. So, um, yeah, we have these microphones in the front if you want to come up and ask a question. I'm also happy to um, walk around the room. And if you want to raise your hand, I can bring the mic to you. Does anyone have a question? Maybe if I can get the mic out of the mic stand. No, that's walk okay. Walk the mic around to you. No burning questions Got right it. now. Our email addresses. We have we have one. Right oh, great! Here. And phone numbers are all up there. Um, we definitely want to connect with all of you, and as well as after the session. Yes, love to hear your question. Hi, thanks, ladies. Um, so basically, my son is diagnosed. However, does the undiagnosed network like work for adults as well? Like, is, would it be like a great resource for like me? Like, I mean, because we can't figure out what's wrong with me. So like. He Absolutely. Yes, the UDN takes adult and All pediatric ADN. patients. Yes. Okay, that's good yeah. to know because, yeah. Awesome. Great. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, so, you know, we actually were going to share the, the UDN's website, but it's a little, it's not udn.org, which we were hoping it was, but it's not. Uh, but if you look up Undiagnosed Diseases Network Harvard, which is where the um, coordinating center is, um, it will come up and the application is online. It'll tell you what to do. And yes, they accept adult applicants. Brilliant, absolutely. because May has denied me four times. Oh, yeah. welcome to ah, okay. Yeah. You would be relate. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. yeah. You would be yeah. amazed at how many parents become diagnosed because their child was diagnosed. Right. It's, it's kind of like a back chaining situation, but all of a sudden people are like, oh, I had that symptom when I was seven too. Well, for our son's condition, it's de novo, but then like, I don't know if it's like just all the stress and just like everything, my body's deteriorating and so nobody can figure out what is going on with me and I'm like in and out of the ICU like every other month and it's like, this is not sustainable because I have to be here for my son in our foundation, so it's like, I need to figure out what's wrong with me. But mm -hmm. now, like, how do I do it? Yeah. I can do it for him, but like, with adults, it's very different, yeah. so. Very and different. if you have questions too, um, there is a phone number on that UDN page, um, and the coordinating center, they're extremely helpful with any questions that you have about the process, about the application, about who gets in and who gets, who doesn't get in, the types of, people that are um, accepted. Um, and oftentimes, too, once those applications are reviewed, even if you're not accepted to the UDN, that oftentimes they'll come back and say, this, this is what you're not going to be accepted, but this is what we recommend. Mm -hmm. And they can make some recommendations for you. So right. absolutely. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, ladies. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah to that uh, point of having a parent get diagnosed because their child was diagnosed. I don't know if anyone here was at the Health Equity Forum at the beginning of the week, um, but they had a, we had a film, or Really Told Stories film that was presented. The last one was um, by Tara Rule, who has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And um, in the film, she talks about how, you know, she had all these various symptoms and her knees, you know, just hyperextended back. And she just thought it was normal because, you know, her mom, you know, her, she would talk to her mom about it and she was in a lot of pain. And her mom was like, well, it's just normal. Like, that's just part of growing up. That was how I grew up and that's how my mom grew up. And it was just, you know, back generations. And so then when Tara got diagnosed um, with Ehlers-Danlos, her mom also did as well for that same reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. And then um, Shruti, <laughs> uh, she also uh, can talk a little bit about um, kind of the maybe access to answers program and um, kind of helping with some of that undiagnosed uh, as well. So I'm going to just. I think there was a question too. I don't know if oh, you want to. Is there a question to... first? Yes question and then I'll come to Shruti. She didn't actually sure. expect me to call her out but I just thought I would call her out so question first and then I'm going to force yes. Shruti to speak Perfect. publicly. Uh, 
quick question, sorry. So my son was fortunate enough to be a part of the Undiagnosed Disease Network through Nashville. Mm -hmm. However, at the timing of his acceptance and everything that happened, COVID hit. So mm -hmm. it was 2020. Um, we weren't able to fully explore all of the options. We did get the exome and genome testing done, but we never had the opportunity to meet the doctors and physicians due to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really personal question. Maybe I should have shared, waited till after, but is there an opportunity to be able for my family and in particular my son have an opportunity to complete what UDN was offering to us, but because of COVID. The pandemic was eliminated from our I, I mean, I, so I don't know, are you on our Facebook page? Okay, so, you know, I mean, what I would be inclined to do is connect you with the coordinating center. I mean, or are you connected with, it's Vanderbilt, right? So um, if you're connected with Vanderbilt and feel like they're responsive to you, Okay. Okay. So then, so then, when people feel like that, and sometimes people do, I mean, all the sites have someone that feels like, yeah, they're not that responsive. Um, there's kind of a range, but anyway. So what I would be inclined to do is really connect you with the coordinating center and and help advocate for like this mom, this family really would like, feels like it would be helpful. Um, and um, Paul is kind of the the leader, the fearless leader at the. Um, the coordinating center and so we can talk after and I'll definitely connect you. And that's a perfect example of what I'm hoping the Navigator program will do is the Navigator will build a relationship with you and make sure that you know well, what is the end point, what is the next step, you know, and there will be communication and, you know, every site <laughs> wants to have great communication with their patients, of course, um, but, uh, you know, there's bandwidth, there was COVID, there is so many extenuating circumstances. So you're a great example of what I hope the Navigators will be able to help with in the future. And you know, like for our example, we started in 2014 and um, whole genome was barely something people could utter. And so when they said, we're gonna do this very extensive genetic testing, and I said, great, how long does that take in my head thinking ancestry.com? And um, they quickly told me they weren't doing what they call the MUT test, that we were doing a whole genome research test and they didn't know how long it was gonna take. So I didn't hear from our center for over 14 months and I was super dis just absolutely disenchanted. I thought, why did we go through all of this? You know, what, you know, what could we have possibly have done? But then science and medicine kind of started catching up with each other. And then it was like the train got back on the tracks and down the road we went. And it's, so sometimes you just have to let things kind of simmer and boil like a little bit at the, at the centers and then they have more information to move forward. Are there any other questions? Okay, while you're thinking of questions, I'm gonna force Trudy to get some FaceTime. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Um, I just wanted to really quickly talk to you about, so um, um, my name is Shruti Mitkis. I'm the, I direct the genetic education programming that Global Genes does. Um, and as a geneticist, I just wanted to underscore, we've heard repeatedly over and over how getting a diagnosis is so much more than just having a name for your condition. Um, and with that in mind, I, I wanted to just introduce the fact that Global Genes is looking to um, set up a whole genome sequencing program that'll help undiagnosed people um, get to a diagnosis. And it also has um, whole genome sequencing with pre and post um, genetic counseling built in. Um, as well as navigation services to help um, get through that. Um, and so I think it's important for everyone to realize that um, there, there are different types of testing, um, clinical as well as research, and typically clinical testing will take about six to eight weeks for a whole genome, um, but research can certainly take much longer. Um, but the, 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 the thing with that is that a lot of um, research labs will put in that extra time to do translational um, studies or, or models in, in fruit flies and mice and what have you. Um, so I, I just wanted to put this in people's mind that um, Global Genes is also looking to, to help patients get to a diagnosis um, and hopefully get educated about their disease and then provide um, support and navigation through that whole process. And you can come to me to get more information about that. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and so Shruti is a great resource. So if you have other questions, all of these amazing people on stage are great to reach out to. Shruti is also great to reach out to. Um, you could also reach out to our rare concierge um, with other questions like that, and we can help triage um, whether it's going to kind of direct you to um, undiagnosed diseases.